Hello, welcome to the October 7th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream. We're going to do a quick audio test to make sure everything is coming through as expected on my end. And then we will begin. Bear with me just for a moment. All right, everything sounds fine on my monitoring computer. As I mentioned, my name is Greg Undo. I'm the host for the live stream. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America, uh, who is the U.S. distributor uh, for Steinberg products in the United States. And I kind of serve as a product specialist for them. And I'll be the host for the live stream today. Uh, I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. area in the United States uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. If you're watching this live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. It's always wonderful to see. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can send questions in advance to Cubase Index, or I'm sorry, to uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. Uh, so you could send questions there or simply ask them in the chat field. I won't have the ability to answer all the questions in real time, but I'll try my best to catch up as the live stream goes on. Uh, when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase, whether it's LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, or other Steinberg programs, which version number, such as 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, and which operating system, that information is often helpful. Um, and if you don't see an immediate response to your question, please... Uh, just be patient. If we could try to avoid asking the same question repeatedly, that would be appreciated. Just speeds it up for me. Um, and if you wanted to, we should have all of the topics uh, covered later tonight. I'll have to go through and rewatch the live stream and come up with the index. And that will be pinned to the top with timestamps of all the topics covered in today's live stream. If you wanted to search for topics covered in other live streams, I believe we're over 21,000 topics uh we you could go to cubaseindex.com we want to thank Jan from stockholm for that and creating that that portal and that wonderful website we have two people that serve as moderators uh so we have agent k and jazz dude they're not steinberg employees they just really do this out of the goodness uh of their hearts to make it a better community so we give special thanks to them and also uh if you want to have a um a number of if you want to look for a great resource of information in, in addition to all the official Steinberg uh, support resources, uh, go to uh, the, the Cubase Nation Discord. And Jazdy does a lot of work compiling information there that's really beneficial to the Steinberg community. All right, so with that, we will go ahead and get started. And I saw that there's one question that kind of didn't get carried over when I popped over my chat. So uh, we had a question. Are we going to be able to change the color of the main cursor? So I assume it's going to be like the cursor here. Um, and I think that this color is just going to be set, you know, at the operating system level. So it's just uh, so you can often change that at the operating system. But I believe that any change you make at the operating system, like I used to have a like a base that was angled over for my cursor. Um, and then that would work in all programs. So I think that's just kind of more of an operating system level function. So, all right, let me just jump back to our live questions. All right, so we see Peter from Montreal. Thanks for being on with us today. All right, we have Stefan from Sweden. We see Jazz Dude from Germany. We have Jan as Cubase Index from Sweden. Uno Memento from Finland. All right, Robbie Bowling from Dallas. Mixing Tips is on. We have Graham Gardner from West Yorkshire, UK. Best Green Jesus from San Diego. John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Um, in rendering settings, I'm not, I'm not getting delete source event. Can you help? So sometimes uh, the actual uh, event 
You know, it could matter if you're selecting the track versus the particular event. So, um, so we'll show this because there'll be different options depending on what is actually selected. So I'll just open up this project to show. So say if I wanted to render this event and we go to our render settings, that on our source event settings, we only get to keep source events unchanged or mute source events. But if we select the track and not the event, but the track itself at this point, when we come to our render settings, we will just come and we'll see our additional sources for removing the source tracks and or disabling the source tracks. So at that point, make sure that you have the um, actual track selected as opposed to an event. And if, you know, sometimes you may have like an event selected way down if you just kind of click on an empty space and then select a track, that'll make sure that the track is selected. All right. Okay, so we just see a question. Uh, when using the comp tool in Cubase 12 Pro, when I press Alt and click, uh, for some reason it duplicates instead of cutting. Uh, is that supposed to happen? Thanks. So I'm not sure if you have to use the Alt tool to cut. Um, so let me just open up uh, a project here with some comping. Okay, so, you know, so let's say we'll come over here and I'll open up the lanes. I'll make these all a little larger. So, you know, when using the comp tool, you know, you don't have to hold down and this is the comp tool that looks like a hand. So anytime that you just drag over a particular event, then it's going to cut. Um, so let's say if I hold down my alt tool, um, at that point, it looks like it's just it doesn't look like it's doing anything differently here. Sorry, I'm just going to get the right. So let me just hold down. So if I wanted to split, you know, I could hold down the alt tool for that, but just to actually cut and do different comps, I just could drag over with the particular comp tool once that's selected. So let's say I just drag and that will make a cut. And then if I wanted to cut an existing cut part, that's when I could hold down the, uh, the alt or option tool. And if I hold down command or control, we could just play that particular uh, cut in that particular edit right there. So let me know if you're doing it differently than I am, but it looks like we could cut uh, the initial selection with a comp tool. Um, so you could do that. And if you wanted to just grab the comp tool without having to do that, but if you wanted to split the section, to, to split the selection, you can do that with the comp tool if needed. All right, so we have Marvin Earl just saying, yo, what up? So thanks for joining us. We have Spike Williams checking in from Wales. We have Nick from the UK. All right, and we have Mark Winslow just watching from San Diego instead of, I think, the usual Honolulu. Thanks for joining us. And John Costigan says, we love likes. So yeah, if you do learn a new tip or trick, uh, make sure that you support the live stream by clicking on the likes. All right, and we have uh, NJ Budiman checking in from Nashville. All right, and we have Patrick Svensson from Sweden. I think he had emailed a question in. All right, and we have Rob. 
from Tarpon Springs, Florida. I hope you're okay with the storm. Okay, so we have uh, from a uh, question. I recently purchased Cubase. Overall, it's been positive, but why can I not change the direction of the mix console scrolls with the mouse wheel? So dumb. Um, so I think if we, uh, let's say if we're in the mix console, so if I'm here, uh, I'm gonna scroll up and it goes to the right. Let's see if I change the mouse wheel direction in like system preferences. So I'll just come right there. We'll change the scroll wheel direction. So now uh, the scroll wheel is just simply inverted. So if I scroll up on my mouse scroll wheel, it scrolls to the left. And then, so just go to your operating system and go to the system uh, and, you know, like here I go to the mouse and then whatever it's set for in your operating system, you can invert it there if needed. Okay, so we have uh, just a question. Uh, hello, Greg, uh, Cubase 12 Pro. What is the best tool to remove unwanted background room noise? Um, so, you know, depending on, you know, if you wanted to remove it from a source, so a lot of people will use a noise gate to get rid of it. It doesn't necessarily get rid of the noise. Like, you know, let's say if I sp stop speaking and then like, you know, we may hear just like a little bit of noise. Um, so that noise could would could still be going on while I speak, but it may not be apparent when it's not isolated. So a noise gate could take care of that. And if you wanted to, you know, be able to work and do editing on other tools, if you know, Wave Lab had you know, Cubase doesn't have any native uh, processing for noise removal. Um, you can you know, filter out, you know, different types of noise using spectral layers or taking in a wave lab. There's a lot of plugins that do that, you know, for like really, uh, you know, demanding tasks. A lot of people will use spectral layers pro where you could actually just take a bit of the noise, isolate it and filter it out. Um, and then you could also use, uh, like isotope RX is an, another popular choice. All right. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a smart way to multi-save settings like an effects chain for a mix of EST instruments, plug in mixer settings in Cubase Pro 12 and be able to load from all in one load? So yeah, let's come over here and get this done. This question is mailed in as well. Okay, so let's say in this in this case I have like multiple outputs of my track. So let's say I have, you know, drums, multiple outputs, and then I have these all going to uh, a drum group here. I have an effects send, and let's just add something like maybe on a kick bus, like an insert. So let's say, okay, we have these, and I wanted to also just put maybe as an insert plugin, a, a envelope shaper, let's say on a kick. So, and if we go to my snare track here, I'm gonna have all of my, I have my reverb, so we go to our effects send. So if I want to, so I want to add more reverb. So if I wanted to recall all of these settings, I could just simply select all of the tracks and I'm going to go to, to my file menu and let's choose to export selected tracks. 
So we could copy the media files if we want to or not. And we'll hit OK. <clears throat> and we're going to call this uh, Play Boz. Records. Okay, so now we've exported that. I'm going to close this project. And let's just start a new project. <clears throat> so I export the selected tracks. And now what I want to do, and this may seem counterintuitive just because of terminology, but you want to import a track archive. So we're going to go, I think it's saved on my desktop. Um, so here's my track archive. And at this point, I'm going to select all we could choose to, you know, not import the events or to exclude automation. So now when I come right over here, I hit OK. And as we play, everything will be preserved. So I still have my effects that are the same. If I go to my snare track, you know, we could just say, OK, I just want to go to my snare track. And here's my reverb, and my reverb is automatically uh, preserved. My group settings are also saved. So everything could just be, uh, so select all of the tracks. And if I just wanted to open this up, we could see all of our uh, buses internally within the instrument. So uh, select all the tracks, export selected tracks, and then go to import track archive. <clears throat> All right, so we see Filter Freak on, wishing everyone a happy Friday. And we have Sam Rasta checking in from Munich. All right, and we have Rod Angles just says, uh, hello, thank you so much for this live stream. So you're welcome. And thanks to everyone for asking questions so we could still do it and help people out. Wonderful to see Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. Okay, so we have uh, from Ch uh, Chandelier Jet. Uh, Hi, is there a way to change the Cubase algorithm so that it doesn't warp audio when you transpose it and it changes uh, and it changes the size? It gets smaller with higher pitch and bigger with lower pitch. So yeah, let's go ahead and I'll just go to this project here and activate it. Okay, so right now, if I come and I wanted to do time stretching on a particular loop, so let's say we'll just listen to this for reference. All right, so often when I, let's say if I just do a sizing applies time stretch, it'll play back kind of the same pitch. Or if I choose to elongate it, it'll play the same pitch. But if I want it to kind of mimic almost something similar to analog tape, what we could do is just switch this algorithm to elastic and one of the one that one of the algorithms here that says tape. So now as I stretch, it's gonna be almost like uh, a sampler or analog tape. Pitch changes, or if I just wanted to stretch it out, we'll see that the pitch goes lower. So just uh, all you have to do again is just to come and select the event and you'll see an algorithm selection and you can do it from the info line or directly from the pool window. So at this point, we could just say, okay, I want to take this particular file, and then you'll see the algorithm and just switch it to a tape algorithm. And then that should do kind of exactly what you want to do. Let me know if that helps.
Okay, uh, so we see, uh, hi Greg, in regard to my question from October 4th about creating a macro for automation that will allow me to delete automation between locators for a selected track. Uh, I've tried it in Cubase 11 Pro, but I don't have a parent object selection. I appreciate if you'd be able to show it with the automation lane selected. I don't understand why, why I keep getting stuck with it. Thank you so much for everything. All right, so let's say I have, um, this and let's say at this point I want to we'll select and I have my left and right locators here and I'm just going to draw in some errant automation all right so in version 12 it added the capability of not having an automation lane open um, when working with this so we and so with version 12 there's a new function in a project logical editor to select to be able to have the track selected and be able to select automation without having the automation lanes open so let's take a look and i think we could do this in 11 but you may have to actually select the particular track so let's go to our project logical editor Okay, so what we want to do is to delete uh, media type is equal to automation. And we'll say position is uh, inside cycle, I think inside cycle. Okay, let's give this a try. So we see my automation. So so then we can see all of our automation in the cycle marker was just automatically deleted. So say if I come, but again, uh, if I just come here, just say apply, uh, that will delete the automation inside the cycle. So let me know if that helps. And with version 12, as we showed on Tuesday's live stream, if we didn't want to have this particular automation lane open and selected, we could just come and have this and choose uh, an additional property. And we say property is set to uh, parent object is selected. So the parent object is the track and then we have the automation within that. So. Let me know if that helps with version 11. I'm pretty sure that all will work in version 11. All right, so wonderful to see Capt Energy music from Pennsylvania. All right, so you see uh, from Ace Man, it's like, why do I need to change an OS uh, that is not a solution? I guess this is with the scroll. Every other program works the correct way. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure how, you know, you know, I, I understand if it's not the not the way that you want to do it, but you know, I don't think that there is a set in stone method or direction for scrolling. Uh, you know, with kind of mixers with mouse wheels. So, um, but I'll pass along that you know, you know, we've had people and I've asked for it myself to have kind of a way to toggle the mouse scroll direction inside of the program. So, but I'll mention that again. All right, wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo, California. Thanks for being on. All right, so we have a question from Linkman. How can I use the select cursor and cut cursor simultaneously? Um, so if we have, if you wanted to actually cut a selection without switching tools, all you have to do is hold down the alt key or alt or option key and click with the selection tool. And then that will switch the mode of the selection tool to allow you to cut. So if you just do that, uh, you know, hold down alt or option. So that way you don't have to switch tools. You can just hold down the alt or option modifier key.
All right. Uh, so we have a question. How to select all faders and move them together? All right. So let's say I have a number of faders in my mix console. All right. So I'll just move some of these so we can see the proportionality. All right. So if what you want to do is to select the channel. So if you want to do it in the mix console or you could do it on the tracks and that will be reflected. Or if you click in the meter area of the channels, hold down alt or option plus shift, and that will enable Q link mode. And then you could adjust kind of all of the faders. And once you let go of that, we can say, okay, I want to bring that up. And now all the selected channels can just be moved simultaneously. So you could do that via quick link, or you could establish a permanent link for particular channels. But a lot of times the Q link is a great quick solution. Um, that's not permanent or, you know, permanently defined. Uh, so we see Spike Williams. Uh, is there a comprehensive tutorial on Spectral Layers Pro? I haven't found one. So I think Mike Scheibinger has done a number of live streams and tutorials on Spectral Layers Pro. Um, so I would check there and it's, I think it's, if you go to uh, like youtube.com slash, um, you know, this, I think it might be Steinberg Media, uh, but if you go to like the Cubase YouTube channel and then you could see there's like a you know, dedicated wave lab, Nuendo, VST instruments, hardware channels. And I think it's just under the, the, uh, kind of the generic, the original um, Steinberg Media YouTube channel. All right, so we have a question. Um, says, uh, says, greetings. Uh, whenever I use a group track, or have some effects on the sends, it highly increases the volume in, is there some way to handle that? So let's take a look. I'm just going to, we'll start with kind of a oscillator in the brand new track. So let's say everything here is at zero dB. Um, I'm going to, on this particular track, and I'll turn the volume down so you don't get to hear 440K or 440 Hertz. Okay, so we look at my level here. Um, so it says whenever I use a group track or some sends, um, and let me just, I may have a preference that's kind of set with this. Okay, I think I'm okay with that. Um, so if I add this to a effects channel, so let's say, okay, I'll add this to just add it to so and let me just take this down okay I'll just add a different effect it's not gonna have any gain adjustments Okay, so I'm gonna send this to a group channel. So no change there. 
Uh, I'm gonna send it to a plugin without in having any particular processing on it. So let's say I just wanna put it on, um, I think if we go to like maybe an FX modulator and we don't have anything loaded, Just remove that. So there's no change with the groups. So there's no effect loaded here, but we can see that the gain is consistent from the audio track to the effects end and to the group channel. So, so it looks like everything is kind of behaving as it should. So let me know if you've kind of done that, you know, it could be that maybe uh, you're adding like through the sends that you're, you're adding or subtracting gain. All right, wonderful to see Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas. All right, great to see uh, Matt Elston from London. Glad you can make it today. All right, we have Gary Ward from Zephyr Hills and Rudy Baca from Seattle. I miss, I miss going to Seattle, wonderful town. Love that part of the country. All right, great to see Gareth on early. Glad you can make it. All right, and also wonderful to see Millard Brown back. All right. Memory serves, he's from outside of Philadelphia. And we have Steve Thompson from Glenville, New York. All right, we have OL, OL Music from Switzerland. All right, he just says he switched back to Cubase today after 27 years. Congratulations. We're happy to have you back. All right, Tiago from Brazil. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, is there a way to render multiple tracks in place, all the signal and automatically keep the track name? Okay, so let's come and I'll just go ahead and uh, add a couple of loops. So I, I think it depends on the signal flow. So let's say if I just, I'm gonna go home here Okay, so we see the name. I'll just make it a little louder, so. Okay, so we see uh, our track names. Um, so I think if we select these particular events and go to so let's go to edit to render place and go to the render settings if we just do the channel settings that when we hit render if sorry let me just
select this. All right, and I'm not gonna use a custom name. Um, okay, so we have multiple events selected here. I'll just do dry. That those events will carry over the name. And I think where you run into issues is if we're going through the output bus. So let's say if we go to the render settings, I think we do complete signal path. It, it may be like stereo R. Um, so, you know, so it could do it, um, the naming, and I'll make sure to kind of pass this along again as, uh, you know, so it doesn't name it based on the output path, but maybe on the tracks. But again, if you go to uh, the render settings at this point, um, I think channel settings will also maintain the name. Yeah. So if you do just like the channel settings and dry, that'll maintain the name. Otherwise, it goes through the stereo out and it kind of carries the name over from the stereo out. Okay, so you just see, uh, hi Greg, uh, question. I uh, opened up my laptop without the e-licensor the other day and Cubase 12 cannot load because Glock and Spiel and Amped Electro, is this normal? So some of the instruments are still utilizing, some of the instrument sound sets are still utilizing the e-licensor. So, you know, Cubase is on a new system. Some of the new instruments that are on the new licensing system will be, you know, Groove Agent, uh, and backbone. Um, so the other ones will be migrating over as at, you know in time. So all right. Uh, so uh, we see question. Uh, can I copy a selection of events within a MIDI clip and place? these event events at the same spots, but a beat later. Okay, so. All right, so I'm not sure if you wanted to move it a beat later or copy them a beat later. So let's say we're gonna come and uh, I'm gonna switch my snap here and we'll just say um, grid and I'll just say we're going to put this to quarter notes. So if I want it to, you know, take all of the events and copy it, let's say I'll just do a couple of events here and copy it over, you know, you just hold down the right modifier key that would help. So if you hold down like alt or option, you could just nudge it over one beat. Uh, if you wanted to take all of the events and be able to nudge, you know, at this point you could just say, uh, there is, I think a whole nudge palette. So activate the nudge here from the settings window. And then I'll go ahead and so I think and then if you wanted to use, you know, the keyboard shortcuts of um, control or command plus the left and right arrow that you can just nudge. So, but if you wanted to you know, just snap automatically um, at that point. So I'm not sure if you needed to copy all the notes, but at this point we could just choose to, you know, let's say if we're here, 
I could copy and then move this and paste the events just one beat over. So, but let me know if that's kind of what you want to do. Okay, so I see from Tiago, and I think you, you may have discussed this in a previous live stream. Uh, it says, I'm having issues regarding audio warp after closing and opening projects. Uh, bounced audio events with audio warp. Also with problems. So I'll just see if we can recreate it here. So I think we may have done this a while ago. So let's say if I take this event and I do audio warping on it. All right, so let's say I'm going to go to audio to bounce selection. All right, and so we can see that these are gonna be different. And let's say if I, I'll just do a save as, and if you want to send me again, Tiago, in case I'm doing this entirely incorrectly. All right, I'll close this project. I'll just add an audio track. Then we could see the changes in the warping and, and bounce selection were preserved here. But I know you'd sent kind of a detailed email. I thought we went through it maybe on a previous live stream, but if you want to send it again, I can make sure to hit it to uh, go through it in more detail on um, on Tuesday's live stream. Wonderful to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. So I believe that the uh, virtual ice cream shall dispense. All right, yeah, great to see Doug O. Uh, so we see a uh, question. Um, is there a way to bulk search for missing VST samples globally? Um, so often, if it's going to be with different instruments, like all the Steinberg instruments, you could search uh, in Media Bay. Uh, but with third party uh, content, you know, it, most third party plugins would have kind of their own content management system. And that would be kind of outside of, you know, how, you know, and Cubase could do it with, you know, plugins that work with VST3 content and naming provisions, but each plugin, like presets could be handled uh, globally, but, you know, each plugin manufacturer may have its own method to find content for intellectual property protection purposes. So, uh, and for a lot of that, there isn't a way for Cubase to find those particular uh, missing VST samples. All right, wonderful to see Michael Pierce on the live stream from London.
Okay, so we see from uh, Diamond District Studios. Uh, hello, Greg in chat. Uh, any tips on reducing audio dropouts on a 2016 16 gigabyte MacBook 2.7 gigahertz? I'm mixing with low plugins and track counts, but my CPU overloads to a point where audio stops. You know, so generally the first thing I would always suggest is just to come over and if you know the first thing to always do in a situation like this is just to go to your audio interface and raise the buffer up and see if the buffer can do that now sometimes people may also you know have one track with like you know 15 insert plugins on that and how kind of the processor scheduling works is you know like this track is going to take one processor or another track is going to take a different processor so you know you may have you know let's say you have like 10 cores but if one processing core is being overwhelmed with you know with plugins and you know and one way to test it is just to come over and you know if you think one track might be causing the problem right click and disable the selected, you know, right click and disable the track and see if there's one track that's kind of pushing you over the edge. So it could be one plugin that could be causing it or a plugin chain that could be causing it. So try raising the buffer and see, you know, where like in, if you have like, you know, a lot of plugins on one particular track and realize that those aren't going in every DAW works this way that all of those processing aren't going to be split across the core. And if you're using a virtual instrument, instead of loading 16 sounds in one instance of the instrument, most VST instruments aren't smart enough to use multiple cores. Consider using, you know, like one sound in, in eight, you know, in eight instances of the plugin, as opposed to one instance of the plugin with eight different sounds loaded in it. And I think you get isolated to one of those particular things. All right, so we see from uh, Play Boz Records about saving the. Um, so he tested with the saving the. Uh, selected exporting the selected tracks and importing the the track archive okay so we see from uh, Robbie Bowling uh, if I'm using sends rather than effects on my basic tracks should that be done as group track uh, drums vocals guitars um, so a lot of times what I would suggest you know is, so let's say, um, so, you know, I would always recommend that you have the individual sends, um, on. So like if you're doing sends for effects, so let's say I'm here and I will, you know, if I put all these to a group, so let's say I'm going to add a group channel to the selected tracks, I come here. So now all of my drums are in this group. So if we solo the drums and I put like an effect send. So at this point, let's say I put a reverb on. So now the entire drum kit gets mixed with the same effects. So a lot of times what we want to do is to have a little more flexibility because you're going to want probably separate effects processing on kick, snare, and overheads. So if we just come here and say, okay, I want to select all these tracks. And now we go to add effects channel to selected tracks. I could add this track. And now I could say, okay, on my kicks, I don't want that reverb but I want it on the snares so this way we could have kind of varying amounts of the reverb just on 
So let's say at this point, I want to take it off, you know, everything except like my overheads. I don't want reverb on those. So in this way, you have a lot more flexibility where you could just place the effect on the individual source as opposed to doing it on all of the drums. Now, if you wanted to take all of the drums and do like a compression or EQ on the whole drums, then applying it into the group track could make more sense. But, uh, you know, generally kind of using effects and effects end, I would do individually. That's how I would do it, Robbie. My chat field jumped on me. Let me just find my spot. All right, so we just see uh, feature request, um, align time and pitch for vocals, uh, very useful for choir. So sometimes, you know, you know, with choirs, what I found, you know, if they're recorded as an ensemble, that if you take one microphone and you do pitch correction on that versus uh, other ones and maybe once, you know, let's say you have four singers on one microphone and one of the singers is flat. Um, if you do pitch correction on multiple singers together, what could happen is, um, you know, the, the, you know, the three that are in tune and a one was flat, they all get kind of raised together. Um, but you know, you can quantize the pitch. So if you wanted to be consistent, you know, what you could do is show you a trick here. All right, so let's say if we are listening to like our vocal here. So I'm going to do the time alignment, and at this point, um, I'll just say uh, we're going to add, let's say, our target, and let's create our destinations, and so we could align rhythmically the audio, but what you could do is, you know, if you have the chord track uh, with very audio, if you wanted to just come, we could use the scale assistant and we could say, okay, I wanted to use the editor scale or the chord track. And then you could quantize the pitch of each of the vocals. Uh, and that could go a long way. But again, if you have two people, they're out of tune and four of them are captured on microphones, you could, you know, correct the two that are out of tune, make those in tune and the ones that were in tune, are now out of tune. So, but you know, if you wanted to take a bunch of individually recorded tracks, just choose to do a quantize pitch. Um, and then you could just simply, you know, have them all be very consistent. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to link multi-out instruments audio with its corresponding MIDI track? Example, machine with 16 outs enabled and one MIDI track uh, per audio channel. So yeah, um, show you how to do this. Revert this. All right, so let's say on um, this 
particular drum part. I don't have machine, but I think principle will be the same as long as the instrument supports kind of uh, multi outputs, which I believe it would. So let's say if I'm going on here, so I have like one MIDI track, I'll just drag a pattern over. Okay, so, um, so right now we see that this is going out of, uh, if we go to my mix console, everything is going out of uh, one particular output. Uh, but if I go into my instrument, this will be done differently on different instruments. I can say, okay, I want my snare to go out of output two, my hi-hat out of output three. And let's say, you know, toms for, let's say my overheads, I put six, my room. So let's say now we have these automatically uh, being sent to different outputs. Um, and then when we click here, so this is all one MIDI channel, uh, we could see all the outputs and these outputs automatically show up in the mix console as well. Um, so let me know if if that makes sense. I see, say, uh, one MIDI track per audio channel. Um, you know, if you had a number, you know, so, but, you know, you could have that be multi-timbral as well. So, like, if I had, um, let's say, here I have, like, a Rhodes patch. And again, we'll see this is all going out of one instance of like Howling and Sonic SE. So I open up this and let's say I wanted to layer it with the xylophone. Um, so I could put these to the same MIDI channel. So I could say, okay, let's layer these together. Uh, but I wanted this to go out of a different output. So now at this point, I'll just, and let me just, so you hear kind of the xylophone. I'll just get a different sound here real quick. It's not so mapped. So, and within the instrument, all I have to do is say, okay, I wanted to go to the mix. And I can say, let's go to output two. So if we watch my mixer here, output two is turned on. So now, you know, I have one MIDI channel or multiple MIDI channels all going to different outputs. So. All right, uh, so we see a question. Uh, is it possible to link audio slash MIDI to each MIDI track uh, behave as an instrument track? It'd be awesome for audio channel automation to write on MIDI track. You know, so one of the things that you could do if you're not aware of this, if you want it instead of like MIDI CCs, if you wanted to turn that into, uh, you know, into automation, if you come here and go to the CC automation setup, you could choose whether as you are writing uh, automation or whether you're writing MIDI CCs that these show up as automation tracks or MIDI CC. So you could just kind of tie it in together. So, um, So, you know, but, you know, obviously if you have instrument tracks, you have a lot more flexibility with that. And maybe, you know, what we just showed will allow you to use kind of multi-timbral capabilities with an instrument track. Uh, but if you needed to, you know, see all of your automation, you could just say, okay, I wanted to 
when I do volume, I want I wanted that to be this CC to be written as an automation track as opposed to MIDI CC within the particular part. So let me know if that's helpful. All right. Um, so you see, what is the best way to convert sample rates for a project with minimal minimum artifacts to the audio files? Um, I have difficulty making my mind up. Should I record at 48K and convert to 44.1K or the other way around? What do you think? You know, some people think will always work at 48K, you know, even going back to DAT days because they felt it captured more data. Um, but, you know, think of it as what you want to you know, where you want the final destination to be. So if it's, you're going to be releasing on audio CD, 44.1 is fine. If you're going to be doing, you know, tying it to video at some point, which would be probably likely, or if you want to actually work on a particular file and, you know, you're thinking in the future, I want to do Dolby Atmos, that's going to be a 48K. So you may want to start at 48K. But if to kind of switch a project easily... Uh, all you would need to do is to come over um, and just find a, let's see if I had this open recently. We'll just open it. So let's say I wanted to switch the sample rate of this project, and this is at uh, 44.1. So let's say, so just to kind of get an idea of the tonality of it for pitch reference. So if I come to my project menu and go to project setup, uh, so I just say, let's make it 48K. I'll say, okay. Uh, it will ask you, do you want to convert the audio files to the new rate? So we'll say yes. Do you want to keep the source uh, files in the pool directory so we could keep the original files? And then it asks, do you want to keep the audio events at their sample positions? Choose no. And now all the files are 48K and playing back at the same pitch. So once again, just go to the project setup from the project menu, <clears throat> change the sample rate, and it's probably like, yes, yes, no. And you may, if you have files that are in musical mode, you may have to write the files in musical mode before it does the sample rate conversion. So. All right, so we have a uh, great to see Jack Shot Records from BC in Canada. Okay, so we see, uh, is there a key command to turn pre-count on for the metronome? All right, so let's come over here. Okay, so let's just look it up. Um, This might be under transport. Just search under count. So use pre-count. So if you just kind of come right over here. And so just look uh, for count. And then you'll see use pre-count. And this is going to be in the transport area. So it doesn't look like there is a default key command. But you could easily assign one just by selecting 
the function going into, uh, and then you could just kind of type in whatever key that you want to do it. And you can see if that key is already assigned and then click assign. See, Benny has studio work from morning to evening tomorrow. That's great. Gareth wants everyone to remember to automate the like. So hit the like button. And that he's going to pass the hat around for us later. For me later, I guess. Right. All right. Wonderful to see Camille uh, from Czech Republic. Thanks for being on the live stream today. All right, and we have uh, Danger Moss from Sweden. All right, uh, so we see um, question, uh, how best to set up input and output bus so I can hear audio when using Cubase on my laptop with onboard sound and ASIO for all? Um, so I, have just kind of a um a mac so there isn't really asio for all here but you know so let's say we go to your audio system uh and um here you've selected the asio for all then you'll see a control panel and here you'll be able to see you know anything any audio interface that's connected to your system so if you're just using kind of the built-in audio interface you may, you know, may say something like, you know, real tech or, you know, you know, something like that, whatever the onboard driver, you should see it listed right here in like a routing area. So as you for all kind of takes anything that's an audio interface that's connected to the system. So maybe like an HDMI connection, even if that's, if you have an HDMI connect cable connected, um, and then you just set kind of the routing right there directly from the ASIO for all and tell it where to go. And then once that, you, once you tell it to go to the right device, just go to your audio connections and you can do it on outputs or your control room. And just simply at this point, you'll see the ASIO for all and then the, the input and output ports right there that you want to send it to. All right, great to see the uh, Monk Beats on. Thanks for joining us. Okay, uh, so we see, um, and this I think maybe a follow-up to the selecting automation uh, on the track. Uh, it says, hi, Greg, uh, thanks. I've tried it, but Cubase 11 Pro, but deletes automation in all the tracks in the cycle range and not just on the selected track. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, I'll put automation. I'm going to define a quick range here. And I'm going to put automation on several tracks here. So let's say. And I think this will work the same way in 11. Thank, thank you for the clarification. So let's come to my project logical editor. Okay, so here we're gonna say is equal to automation. So we want to delete. Let me remove this. Uh, so to say media type is equal to automation. And then we're gonna insert uh, property is set we'll, to track is selected. And then we want to say our position is inside cycle. So let's see if this, so we see if this works. All right, let me try switching the order of that. All right, 
right, so it looks like it did it on both of them there. Okay, oh, sorry. So let's... Sorry, property here is... All right, so I think, um, all right, so right now we have the um, the track selected, but we don't have the automation events selected. I think that's gonna be the Okay, so let me just Okay, so let's make a macro for this. So let's come over here and we're gonna build a macro. So we're gonna say key commands. And let's, uh, you'll see macros, so show macros. And we want to do new. So we'll say delete automation on selected lane. I'll just. Okay, so we want to just select all on track and let's add that particular function. I'm gonna save this as a preset. Okay, so in Kind of give it a name. Okay, so, um, and I'm just gonna make sure. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and see if this works manually. Still carried it over. All right, let me see if I could take I'm trying to do this with ending. Let's try one more time and maybe if this is
Okay. Okay, so I think... Okay, so um, I'm gonna try this and we'll say media type is equal to automation and positions inside cycle PPQ and property set to is selected. So I'm just going to, so if I do this without the event selected, Okay, so let's go back to our macro. And I'm gonna add this logical project logical editor preset. Okay, so we have the edit select all on project. So I'm gonna now come over to process project logical editor. And we're gonna add this project logical editor preset. Okay, so we see automation on multiple tracks here. I have this one selected. Let's go to macros. Then it only did it for that one. So, sorry, it's a bit long-winded. All right, so if you have it selected, um, again, go to key commands, and then, you know, you could show macros if you don't have that already turned on. Um, so we want to do an edit, select all on the tracks. And this is with this particular track selected. And then we're going to say process the project logical editor preset. Uh, and that is going to be under the functions, we choose delete, media type is equal to automation. It's gonna be inside the cycle for position and property is going to be is selected. Um, so at this point, if I wanted to do it on, we'll test it on this track here. So we have automation going on, that one is selected. We go to, uh, and then we could just trigger that macro and you could assign a keyboard shortcut to that macro, then only that automation uh, on that particular event was deleted, so. So I'm sorry for misunderstanding and you know, and that's one of the reasons that was kind of updated in version 12 with the parent object, but I believe you should be able to do that uh, in combination with the macro. And then if you wanted to assign a keyboard shortcut to the macro or access the macro directly from the macro menu, you could do it right there. And my macro list is big because of all the ones I just kind of make during live streams. All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, all right, so we see the Monk Beats is, uh, he's number 57 on Smashing the Like in Diamond District Studios, 58. All right, so we have a question from the Monk Beats on MIDI Remote. Um, so we see, uh, when I save a script for a device, does it back up mappings? Um, so if you have a script, um, so it'll be kind of in, in the, in the program, but if you want it to take a particular, uh, so let's say if I come here and I select the device and we go to set up here at this, um, so I think if we click on the scripts menu at this point, um, you could export the script and you could see the script location directly there. So, um, so it's just a file, but you could export it if you wanted to pass it on to someone else. 
All right, and kind of a second part of the question. Uh, also, can you confirm that I can't map parameters from a plugin on insert, which I usually did with legacy MIDI remote. So I don't think you have any problems doing that. So let's say if I come to my Nectar controller here and I have an insert on this particular parameter. So let's say, okay, I want this to be my ratio okay so if i wanted to now come over here uh i could so let's say i'm going to just double click so i move this knob and then on the parameter i could just say uh pick for midi remote mapping ratio and then i'll just hit apply so now as i move the knob here um, you have to close this window. Um, so I move the knob. We'll see that you can just come directly here. If you have those set up as quick controls, you could also, as soon as the plugin is active, you can map any of the parameters to quick control. So you have access to all the parameters and plugins wherever they are on your system. So no problem. All right, so we have uh, Elizabeth Gomez says, uh, joining you from Madrid. So I've been in Madrid a bunch of times and when I was younger. Uh, so welcome. It says, I'm Peruvian. Uh, I would like to know if I could eliminate the name tag at the, at the upper beginning and end part of any given event. Um, so say if we have the event here, I think that there is a way to... Um, might be a preference. Let me just show event names. So let's hit that. And then you don't see the event name. So uh, go to preferences, Elizabeth to event display, and then you'll see show event names. So let me know if that works for you, and thanks for being on the live stream. All right, so we see from Best Screen Jesus, uh, the name issue only happens in the key editor. The audio editor has a name underneath the loop section, so it doesn't interfere. wonder if it's a bug. So I think it's just kind of how it's designed, but let me just jump to... I'll activate this. I'll show in the MIDI editor. So we show you that if I want to get rid of a particular name, let's say like for my piano, again, I could just come to preferences and show event names, apply. And so we could do it there on the project window or if we're in, um, the event editor here. Um, if we didn't want to see the name, I think it's, there is. Just see where it, Uh, 
uh, there is a way to shut it off. I'm just trying to remember. So I think if we turn this off, show a part handles it there, you can turn it off in the key editor as well, Elizabeth. So I see from Nick says, Greg, uh, you're going to have to start naming your live stream macros with a underscore to start. Yeah, I'm going to need to. My double A, triple A, quadruple A's are all going to get taken up. So as long as I find it pretty soon after, I'm okay. But that's a good suggestion. All right, um, so we see from the soundboard uh, asks, um, the question is, uh, hey, what do you think is the most likely reason for delay when you created a template? I did that a year ago and I had a lot of delay when I turned a single track on, never problems on new projects. So probably, you know, there is this function called the constrained delay compensation. So if you have like a big mapping template with lots of different plugins, you're always at, you know, We'll think of it as kind of like the tax that you have to pay for running a lot of plugins is sometimes each of those plugins can incur latency. So the tax is latency. Um, so, you know, if you have like, okay, you know, have multiband compressors and a whole mastering chain uh, all going on in my master bus, all those things cost and their, you know, their fee is the latency. So what you could do on your template if you wanted to temporarily bypass latent plugins, that's what the, the, the constrained delay compensation function is for. And what that'll do is as you click here, that will bypass all of the latent plugins. So just try turning that on and see if that makes a difference um, and then turn it off and then see if you notice. And what that's gonna do is basically turn off all the plugins that are causing a lot of latency in the system so that as you're working, it will uh, you know, just not have those plugins incurring their latency or you know, of that tax. So you could you know, work without a delay. All right, so I see from uh, Jeremy Nakamura, um, have you always been able to do that? So I'm not sure uh, where that was or what function it was because I'm probably, you know, maybe 10, 20 minutes behind the live chat. Uh, but if you give me a frame of reference, I might be able to give you some more information on that. All right. Um, so uh, from Jazzy Lamel, uh, hey Greg, sorry for asking us again, but I forgot how to export a wave and MP3 file at the same time. So if we come over here and this is a function that was introduced in Cubase 11 with the export queue. So we'll just come right over here, let's do export audio mix down. So we say, okay, I wanna take like my stereo out, let's say, and I'm going to, have this be a wave file. So we'll say, okay, I want this to be a wave, 48K, 32-bit. And then we'll see this export queue. Make sure that the export queue is expanded. Click on add to queue. So let's say now I want to export an MP3 file at 320K. Click on add to queue. I want this to be, so now when you hit start queue export, at that point it would 
do the WAV file, then it's going to do the MP3 file right after. So make sure that you go to the export queue and then just as you have all the settings here, just choose, uh, you know, add it to the queue and then you'll be all done. And you could save those as presets so you could quickly recall commonly used formats. Okay, so we see uh, from Don Jave, uh, I'm switching from Logic to Cubase. Congratulations, we're happy to have you in the family. Uh, I'm looking for some tutorials, but can't find any. So, um, so if you go to you know YouTube.com/slash Cubase, um, you know there's you know on just the live streams. You know I think this is our 248th live stream, and I did it kind of account about a month ago is like 1,582 hours of just live streams that you could go through. So go to cubaseindex.com. You could like look for tips, you know, but there's literally thousands of videos on, you know, there's probably about a thousand videos on youtube.com slash Cubase. You could also look at like produce like a pro Chris Salim or look at, um, Dom Sigalis as well, uh, but there's lots and lots of tutorials available, and you know, and we do these live streams every Tuesday and Friday. So any questions you have in your transition to Cubase, uh, we're here to help you with that. So welcome and thanks for joining us for the live stream. And uh, and again, uh, we're happy to have you as a Cubase user. All right. All right, so we see uh, Don J just says I'm a film comp I'm a film composer. I'm looking for switching from Mac to Windows and want some tutorials on that. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, so you know, there's a you know we may not have tutorial. You know, sometimes doing tutorials on switching from one to the other, like a lot of tutorials may be on one single platform. But I think that with Cubase, you know, once you have Cubase open. It's really, you know, once you get the modifier keys kind of in muscle memory, you know, that you'll be in good shape. And I go back and forth between Mac and PC all the time. So, all right. So we see the heartbreak time machine has smashed the like button. So thank you for that. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hello, Greg. Uh, what's a quick way to combine multiple MIDI files to one track? Uh, I have kick, snare, hi-hat, crash, MIDI data on separate tracks, and I want to put on one track for Groove Agent. Okay, so let me just... Just come here. I'll just drag a pattern out. I'm going to split it. Oh, I already have one here. All right, so I'm going to take this particular pattern. Um, so if you want to learn how to split the notes, I'm just going to do this. You go to MIDI and choose to uh, dissolve part. So let's come over here, let's put on separate pitches. All right. So let me see if I remember, uh, know how to do it manually, but let's see if we could. Yeah, all right, so all you have to do is um, select the events here. And then you'll have a, go to MIDI, and you'll see Merge MIDI in Loop. And we could include different elements, so we'll just come here, hit OK, and now everything will be um, just combined together as opposed to individual notes. So select all of the events that you want to merge. And then from the MIDI menu, merge MIDI in loop. 
and to do it easily just make sure that you have the loop that's I, I don't think you need the loop but it may place the position at the loop so All right, uh, so we see a um, question. I'd love to be able to zoom in and out and nudge from knobs that don't send note info. I have to use one button for zoom in, another for zoom out. Is this functionality coming to MIDI remote? So a lot of times it's up to the MIDI controller itself if it transmits different values. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of times when you're working with it, you know, some controllers, like, you know, if I just wanted to, like, I have a CC-121. And I just have it on jog, so I go backwards. The knob is uh, sending different messages when it goes backwards as opposed to when it goes forward. So it's really a, a limitation. You know, if your value is only sending one type of MIDI message, um, then, you know, it's basically gonna go, you know, that knob is only capable of transmitting like one message as opposed to two messages, but some knobs will allow you to do that, so. All right, so Uno Memento is saying one more smash and we have 100, so that's great. Um, so I just see reconnecting or sharing between programs, MIDI devices on the fly doesn't work nice on windows. So, you know, I, I routinely kind of, you know, you know, it's not an issue with Cubase on windows for me of, you know, being able to, you know, connect. And I think this is added in Cubase 8.5 before that we would have to restart the program. If you connected a MIDI controller afterwards, uh, so now you can just, you know, hot swap MIDI devices. If it's being recognized by the operating system, it could be, you know, maybe that particular device doesn't work well, but I haven't had any problems at all. See, David M just says, don't you think Tuesdays and Fridays come around very quick? So it's a Tuesday and Friday nights when I'm doing the index that, that takes a long time. So. All right, so we see Paul Claridge just says, awesome, thank you, learned two things. That's great. All right, so we just see uh, from the Heartbreak Time Machine, I was on Sonar for over a decade, moved to Cubase this year. I'm blown away and so glad that I made the switch. These dreams only cement my conviction it was the right choice, so that's great, and we're so happy to have you as a Steinberg user. Okay, um, so you just see a question. Uh, how can I turn on automatically turn on plugins when I enable a track uh, and they were disabled on the disabled track? Okay, so let's say I have a number of plugins here. So let's say. Okay, so let's say I have all these plugins. I'm going to disable the track. So I just right click and we'll see that now all the plugins are gone. And then when enabling the selected track, all the plugins come back for me. Um, so let me know if that uh, is working differently than you. And just make sure I'm reading this from the sound bar. It says, how can I turn automatically turn on plugins when I en enable a track and they were disabled on the disabled track? So, you know, it's so again, just we look at the plugins here, disable selected tracks. And so the plugins are, aren't loaded, aren't taking processing power, and then enable selected tracks. Now they're back and turned on. So let me know if that behaves differently for you.
Okay, uh, so we see, uh, hi Greg, is there any controller program to control Cubase from phone slash tablet? Uh, so on iOS, there's a Cubase IC Pro. There's lots of people using like Touch OSC and others. So there's a number of different DAW controllers and you know a lot of them will mimic key commands. Some will transmit MIDI messages, um, you know, but all those will work. Some will be like software versions of Mackie controls. So all those things will work, but check out the Cubase IC Pro if you're on, uh, if you're on iOS. All right, wonderful to see Mike Rivera. I think he's in San Antonio, if memory serves. All right, so we have a question. Uh, how to set up the sample rate to be at default to 48K? So unless you specifically change the sample rate, it's gonna maintain the same sample rate. Uh, so it's just, it's one of those settings. And again, we could go to the project setup uh, and just have your sample rate and that setting, you know, so if I go to a new project, I come here and I go to my project setup, we'll see it's 44.1. Uh, let's say if I switch this to 96K and I do a new project, I think that the settings will persist and kind of stick. So we see that it's 96K. So, um, and the only time that it wouldn't stick is if you specifically had your audio interface clocking externally. So, um, so it, those settings will automatically stick, but if we wanted to, uh, if your audio interface, if you're externally clocking it and you could clock it via like a BNC connection or through a digital connection, like SPDIF, uh, toss link light pipe, ADAT light pipe, or, um, you know, or AES EBU, then you could do that. But the sample rate, if you always, if you don't change the sample rate, then you don't, ha it'll still keep that same sample rate. All right, so I see from uh, Mark Kiambo, it says, seems you missed my question. So sorry, I didn't, uh, Sometimes some questions don't come in, uh, but I apologize if I missed your question. I don't recall it. Um, and the question is, is there a way to import MIDI mappings made using Cubase 11 to Cubase 12, or do I have to do it manually in Cubase 12's MIDI remote? So pretty much all of your MIDI, um, you know, if you go to the studio setup, um, the generic remote settings and your Mackie remote, like your CC121, all of those settings will get carried over from Cubase 11 to Cubase 12. Uh, the generic, rem the new MIDI remote system, you know, this will be going away over time as all of these functions and features have migrated over to the MIDI remote. But we've had people that have painstakingly set that up so we don't necessarily get rid of it. But, you know, with the new MIDI remote, it's, you know, so much easier to kind of uh, map all the different functions to multiple MIDI remote controllers. It's much more straightforward. But all the settings uh, should automatically carry over. And if it doesn't, just go to your edit menu and then go to your profile manager and export your profile manager, uh, export the profile from your Cubase 11 and import it into Cubase 12. Sorry if I missed your question. I don't remember seeing it, uh, but thanks for asking again. Um, so we see a uh, question. Uh, any news on Steinberg updating the program manager, something along the lines of native instruments or tune track, whereby the manager will let you know or updates or programs are available. So I think it's in the works. I haven't been officially told. I just kind of heard kind of an illusion that there's kind of working to it. it's like a huge project. You know, sometimes it's easier to start these projects um, 
from the ground up versus, you know, Steinberg's been in business uh, 38 years, almost 39 years. So being able to migrate older systems into newer systems is a lot harder than kind of starting off with a particular system. So I believe that's kind of the whole idea. So we kind of see, you know, the integration of the activation manager and the Steinberg download assistant where that will be kind of more of, you know, a manager to make it easier. So I think that they're working on it, but I have no idea what the time frame is. I'm usually not in those discussions, unfortunately. You know, I just work for the U.S. distributor, so I'm an Oompa Loompa in a world of Willy Wonkas. All right, so we see from the sound bar, uh, and this is, I think, going back to our latency on the template, says, I'm wondering because I had that delay problem I mentioned and had all tracks off, so all plugins off, but somehow much more delay than on an empty project. Um, so, you know, it could also be plugins that are on the control room, you know, so if you have different plugins like metering plugins and stuff that are uh, enabled on a control room. Those will be independent of tracks here uh, on the actual, you know, on the track list. So yeah, there could be plugins in other sources as well. You see Don Jay was just asking if anyone has a Cubase template for lemur. Okay, so we see from Mark uh, Kiambo, uh says on Cubase 12, I tried mapping the stereo to mono button on a control room to a MIDI controller, uh, but a button on a control room will, will briefly change then back to the previous setting no matter the mapping. All right, so let's say I wanna take um, a knob on my nano control here, so I will So let's come over here. I'm just gonna go to control room under key commands. Then I think we could do um, select next down mix preset. All right, so I'm gonna apply the mapping. All right. All right, and let's come over. I'll just revert this. All right, so let's get to my down mix presets. So I'm going to hit this button. So let's say I'm playing. So with the map down mix preset, so I just hit it once and let go. And then I could just hit it again. So, and I'll just open the MIDI remote. So you can see, we're going to hit the button here. Hit it again. Let go. So make sure, um, you know, depending on the function. So, but, you know, what I have it assigned to is under key commands, uh, control room. And then select next down mix preset. And that's the function I have. And that seems to, the setting seems to stick. So maybe you try that, Mark. So 
Let's see, Mike Rivera says, great memory, Greg. I am from San Antonio. So you have an annoyingly good memory, but I can't pick what I remember. So like, you know, I could, you know, someone I met 30 years ago, I could tell you what, what equipment they had in their studio, but you know, some other stuff, you know, just kind of random at times, but it's helped me a lot. All right, so we have a question from uh, Vishnu from India. Thanks for joining us. Um, and his question is, uh, if you want a particular set of colors for all the sessions in Cubase, how can we set that? Uh, now I'm only using templates set up with particular colors, wondering whether there are custom. Um... All right, so. You know, once you have the colors kind of set up, you know, a lot of people will set it up in a template and, the, you know, generally the colors are kind of transferred over with the particular project. But if you go to the project color setup, so it's like, okay, I want it, you know, just to come and like, let's say I have my first color is white and I have, you know, different colors that I've created and I wanted to change this shade of green ever so slightly, whatever. So I like these particular colors. And then if we go over to options, you could then say, uh, save this color set as default. And then everything that you will, you know, every project that you start will have that particular color set that you've defined. Or you can say, I want to reset the color set to default. And now when I come here, you know, we could just have different color sets. So try that. All right, so we see Noah's got the macro working. And that was the macro with the automation. So thanks for letting me know. Always makes me feel good when you know that I was able to help someone. Okay, so we see Mark Kiambo says, Thanks, Greg. I did use the next down mix preset, but mine behaved differently. So one other thing to check. Um, I think like once you're so let's say if we have Let's say if we, uh, let me see if I could just find this. Maybe in the, I'll just see if we can get my brain cramp here. Sorry. But I think that there is a way, and maybe it's thought that it was in the mapping assistant. And let me just try with another function that's not from a pre-made script.
Okay, so um, like here. So I think if we are, let's say I wanted to define a button. All right, so now when I select this button, um, here where you could kind of change the let me see if now if we go into but there is like uh, an area where you could change and I'm sorry I'm blanking on it but you could change uh, maybe if the button is like how it's transmitted like if you hold it down or I thought it might be there but there there is an area where you could switch um, where you could kind of switch how the actual button uh, transmits I'm sure I'll remember it two seconds after I stopped the live stream but let me see if Okay, um, let's see. So it, when in this mode here, so say we go into the edit mode, select, you know, make sure that like there's, you know, you could check kind of the control message here, but try playing with some of these. I think it might've been, you know, those are, you know, see what message. And, you know, one other thing to do is to see if you have another button on your controller and see if that behaves differently. Some buttons are kind of, you know, not meant to stick. Once the button is engaged, it's like a temporary hold until you let go of the button. So try another button on your uh, controller keyboard as well and see if that makes a difference. Like maybe even if you use a sustain pedal connected to a controller just to see if that behaves differently. All right, so we have Guy Niels uh, Zalamanovic from Tel Aviv. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have a question from John Costigan. Um, uh, it says, uh, hi, Greg, uh, dim question of the day. So the, the only dim question is not asking the question that you have. Uh, render instrument track to audio. Adding group and recording group output seems to not work. What did I do wrong? Okay, so let me just go to a different project here. Okay, so what I always like to do is, you know, take the track itself and then we're going to add this and do a group channel to selected channels because that will automatically route that particular instrument to the group channel. Okay, and I'm going to choose outside folder. So let's say as we play, we're going to see the audio go from, you know, from there to the groups and make sure we can see kind of the activity. And then I want to add an audio track. And at this point for the, I want to make it stereo. And for the input, I'm going to choose group one. And then one of the things that you have to do often is, you know, make sure like if you wanted to do this at the same time as MIDI, you know, is to enable record on both. So let's say I want to just solo these. So now as I just hit record, you know, I could record in the MIDI. And now it's gonna, gonna record simultaneously to both. 
but you know, make sure that you know a lot of people may add a group and then set the group to the input, but maybe the instrument itself isn't being sent to the group. So give that a try, John, and see if that makes any difference. But also, so if I just wanted to come over here and let's say I put, you know, just I want to solo this and make sure that you know as we're doing this um, that you don't solo the audio track. Uh, because then the MIDI might be muted. So let's say if I'm here and I wanted to record on the audio track. So, and now we will just come over here and let's audition our track. And at this point, You could just hear the audio there. All right, so we see uh, Vishnu just upgraded from uh, Cubase 11 to 12 in the last promotion. That's great, wonderful. Congratulations. All right, so Michael Teams, he also took advantage of the Cubase 12 promotion. He has it up and running, so it's great. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button and win a prize. All right, so we see uh, 115 likes in two hours. Yeah, that is good for. All right. Let's see, best cringy is just, just as uh, MIDI remote manager is just crazy useful. So yeah, it was one of the great new features that was introduced in Cubase 12. All right. See Jazz Dude just doing his vigilant mod moderation here. Thank you for that. All right, so I'm going to, um, I think we had one other question that was mailed in. But let me just. All right, um, so we had a question about how to set uh, the default uh, like fader level or the, the default send levels down when adding. Um, so, and the one thing I noticed with this, and there is a preference uh, if we go into Cubase, so it was like how to set the default send levels to like minus six dB as opposed to zero dB. Um, so how we could do this is there's a preference, I think under VST, where you could say uh, default send level. Now the one thing that once I kind of had set this preference, this preference didn't seem to really engage until I restarted the program. So let's say if I go to my send level here, and I added a send, and before it was at zero dB, that it'll come up at zero dB. So now I'm just gonna exit out of Cubase. And I'll just close a bunch of projects. Thanks for all the wonderful questions today. Hope that everyone has learned a tip or trick. And again, we do this on Tuesdays and Fridays. All right, so now a quick Cubase, and then I'm gonna start Cubase again. So, and we'll see that when I switched it from zero dB to minus six dB. Just 
get this booted up. Okay, so I had an audio track. And now what I want to do is to add a effects channel to that selected track. And let's add the reverb. And now when we go to the send, we'll see that it's at minus 6.02 dB. So at this point, if you want to add the, if you want to change the default send values, go to the preferences and select VST. And at that point, um, I'm not sure why it doesn't take effect until a restart of the program, but once you do a restart, then the settings will persist and kind of stick. See Gerald Ely just mentioning he has an Evolution UC33 controller. The MIDI remote manager has given it a new life. Love it. So it's always nice to take kind of old abandoned uh, equipment that you know wasn't fitting in your workflow and just being able to really optimize it so you could work faster. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So we see Michael Team saying the new CCA music CD uh, will drop in mid December. He's finalizing everything and the paperwork too. All right. Look forward to hearing it. Just let us know, Michael, when it's out. All right. So I think I'm at the end. Um, All right, so we see John Costigan says, thanks, Greg, skipped a step. I'm all better now. I forgot to create the group correctly. So that's good. I'm glad it was an easy fix. All right, so I think I'm at the end of the questions. We'll see if there's more. I got through all the questions that were mailed in advance. We're getting so efficient these days. We'll see if there's more questions that come in. John Koskin wants to, is asking Michael Teams how he cleans a virtual ice cream off of a 3D printer. So that'd be a good invention. All right. Okay, so John Koskin's just saying afternoon off. So I do have to go for a vet appointment with our cat at a little after five, but we'll see if there's more questions that come in. Also, next Friday, I think, is our 250th live stream since COVID started. So uh, let me know if there's anything that you guys want to do to celebrate 250th. So again, uh, next Friday. So looking forward to that. It's been great being uh, able to help so many people during COVID time. So, and you know, and I appreciate just the wonderful community that everyone does, that, that everyone is a part of and really makes it such a great place to spend my Tuesday and Fridays on. All right, I'll still wait a couple more minutes, see if anyone sneaks in with a question. Okay, so we have from uh, Vishnu, um, I've set up a number of MIDI tracks to VST instrument, how to bounce these MIDI tracks uh, inside session. So if you could tell me if you wanted to bounce them as audio or if you want to bounce them as, um, 
Uh, so, or if you wanted to bounce it into MIDI, but we'll show both. All right, so let me just find a project that would work well for this. Here we have some. All right, so let's say I have, you know, piano and like, you know, bass, like a number of different parts. And I wanted to, uh, so if I wanted to bounce all these like to one audio track, I could just say, okay, I wanna take like the piano and the strings, all these multiple MIDI devices, I'm gonna select the tracks. Uh, and at this point, I will just say, let's go to render in place. And I can say, okay, we'll go to our render settings and I have all of the tracks selected. I can do it with events as well. Uh, but when we have channels, uh, settings here. We could now choose to mix down to one audio file and we'll just call this instruments. And now when we render, All right, so as soon as we do this, um, now we have our instrument track and this will be all of just the selected tracks. So as we listen to that, So once again, just select the tracks that you want to bounce down and come over to render in place. Uh, and then what you want to just choose like the mix down. So I'll just not mute those, but let's say, okay, now. Edit render in place, go to render settings, uh, choose channel settings, and then mix down to one audio file. Okay, uh, so you just see, um, just a question, I have a track, uh, guitar and vocal, how can I separate them in spectral layers? Um, so let's come over to the new project. So with Cubase, you get spectral layers one, which will do this. Um, let me see if I have something that will be YouTube friendly. In love affair, there was something all right, so I have this, so we're gonna to go to spectral layer. So I'm going to uh, select the top inspector tab and let's get to spectral layers. All right, and now it's gonna kind of load it in spectral layer. So when we come and it's good to layer and then you'll see unmixed stems. Uh, so in this point, I'm just gonna say, let's unmix the vocals and hit okay. All right, so now when we play, 
Now you can just have the faded And it was perfect when it ended with a knowing glance and smile And then if I wanted to just drag the file out um, from I could just place that right there and then we'll have the guitar and the vocal kind of automatically separate it so once again, go to layers and choose to unmix stem. So even spectral layers one that comes with, uh, you know, comes directly with Cubase, you could just open that up and at that point um, unmix. And if you have a spectral layers pro, you could do drums and bass and, you know, keyboards, you know, and guitar parts kind of automatically like that as well. All right, uh, so we see uh, from Millard Brown, hi Greg, question. Uh, I have a pro license for my main PC, but updated in LE to 11 for a laptop. Um, is it possible to move the license to a soft e-licensor on the laptop? So um, if you actually took the, um, so if I'm not sure if you still have an LE license, um, that's uh, all right just okay so if you have version 11 le on your laptop um what you could do there is a um like a license reactivation so let's say if you wanted to come over here millard So just Google Steinberg Cubase AI reactivation. Um, so, so here you could request another like LE license. Um, so we come right over here. So basically you could request uh, like an a, a LE license for a new computer. So you could just reactivate it. If you have a USB E licensor, you could move it on that as well. Um, but if you don't want to move your USB e-licensor, um, you, you know, so if it's a soft e-license, you could transfer it to a USB e-licensor, but not from a USB to a soft e-license. Um, but, um, but try, you know, just look at the software license reactivation. And then I think you could uh, get it moved to your new laptop. Okay, we see uh, maybe Steinberg could release Absolute 6 for the 250th. And so I'm afraid that their development schedule isn't aligned with my uh, live stream schedule. So. Uh, so we see, uh, can I import key commands from Logic to Cubase? So um, try going to, there's some logic key commands already that are built in. So if you go to your key commands and go to presets that you should, uh, so go to edit to key commands and then just load up, uh, the logic key command set. So give that a shot. See so Miller Brown just says, wow, 250 live streams. That's an amazing record of customer service. Kudos. Thank you so much. Uh, I really look forward to doing these all week and see Nick is saying that for the 250th live stream, I deserve a coffee break halfway through whilst we chat amongst ourselves. So maybe I could take a, uh, a bathroom break during a live stream. So that would be good. <laughs> so having to wait four hours, I always had to make sure not to drink any water at lunch. All right. John Cossigan says, Google search of customer service brings up these hangouts. All right.
All right. Uh, so we see, uh, hey, Greg, I had this question before. I forgot how to do it uh, about how to export an MP3 wave and an AIF file. Okay, so you showed the wave in MP3. But let's go ahead and take a look at AIF as well. So let's say I just go to export to audio mix down. And what I want to do, just close that, sorry. You say, okay, I want this to be uh, an MP3, and you'll see your export queue. So again, just say, let's add to queue. And now I want this to be a WAV file at 48K, 32-bit. You could change those settings. Add to queue. I want this to be an AIF file. Add to queue. I want it to be a FLAC file. So, and now at this point, you would just choose start queue export, and then it would export all of these different file formats and different sample rates and bit resolutions for you. Uh, so you just see a question, uh, hey, is that the spectral layers that comes with Cubase 12 Pro or the full version? So that was the full version, but the uh, the ability to unmix the vocals is also present in the spectral layers one that comes with Cubase, uh, that comes with Cubase as well, so. All right, uh, so you see, uh, hi Greg, library manager confirms I have smooth jazz guitar installed, but uh, it is not in the media bay any reason for this. So let me see if I have smooth jazz guitar on my. So I don't think it's going to be a groove agent pattern, but I'll check just to make sure. So I have all of the standard content uh, that comes with Cubase, and I don't have a smooth jazz guitar. Um, so if you could let me know what category it falls under, David, and uh, we can take a look. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's like a third party content. Um, so we just see a question from Michael Teams. A uh, question to you and everybody out there. Is anybody using Cubase 12 with a FireWire interface? How does it work? Well, thinking of setting up a secondary system for quick response to ideas. So I know, I think uh, Jeff Sabelski is still running MR816s. I had uh, MR816s on my system. And I just kind of migrated to my personal studio. Uh, and then I migrated over to the AXR for you. So I think if you get like the, you know, the FireWire chipset working, you may have to install a legacy driver for your FireWire. If you get that working, then the, you know, then many of the FireWire interfaces will work. Some of them will deal with different chipsets better. Um, so, you know, I've had people go through kind of frustrating time of getting it to work. And then once they kind of, you know, got all the settings dialed in, then it worked, but that could be for one interface and not work for another interface. And it's kind of the nature of FireWire. Okay, um, so we see from Vishnu says, only thing that's not working in Mojave is Halion libraries. Some weird error helper tool is coming up for Verve, Amped Electra. I guess it's causing Mojave. So it might be, you know, 
Um, so sometimes they don't, you know, as they're doing new stuff, it may not go back and do testing on previous versions. Okay, um, so we see a uh, question. Uh, is there an easy, is there a way to easily select all MIDI notes after a selected note within a region? Uh, this is a lot of my workflow coming over from Logic, additionally having notes of a single pitch, thanks. All right, so let's take a look. All right, so let's say if I wanted to select all the notes of the same pitch, I could just hold down shift and double click, and that would select all of that particular, all notes of that particular pitch, like so. Um, and let's see, uh, is there a way to easily select all notes after a selected note? So. Um, so I think if we, let's see if we can do this in the logical editor. So we want to choose select, uh, type is equal to notes and let's choose position is I think we, if we wanted to, I think do it. Beyond cursor. So if we have the cursor set, let's say we have our cursor set there. All right, let's see if we could. Let's take this into the full screen editor. All right, so say my cursor is there. Let's get to our, so maybe, so we could do it based on the cursor position. Um, and then I think if we're in transport, let's say we use video files edit mode it doesn't carry over, um, but we could do it kind of beyond cursor if that's not too horrible of a workaround for you. So to do that, we would just say under the functions to select, um, and we want to select notes that are positioned beyond the cursor. So let me just see if there's You know, and if we wanted to say, you know, take this note, I think we could um, under transport, I think we could probably just move to move to selected note and then Let's see if there's something under transport, but
Okay, so if we just say to uh, locate selection start. All right, so let's say I want to, we'll create a macro. So I'll go to key commands and the new Okay, so I'm going to just type in and let's say I want to save my logical editor as a preset. Okay, and let's go back to my key commands here. And we'll go to process logical editor. We'll add that function. So we'll click on add. All right, so let's say my cursor is here. I select that note. Let's go to edit to macros. Then you could just do it like that. So once again, that logical editor preset. So we want to select notes beyond cursor, uh, and then we want to move the cursor and we'll go to our key commands and let's set up the macro. Good suggestion from Nick on using the underscore. So, and then you just want to transport, locate to selection, start, and then process that project logical editor. And then for the macros, you could come over here and assign the particular macro to assign key commands to that macro if you wanted to as well. And it's always going to be under the edit macros category. All right, uh, so we have a question from Uno Memento. Uh, how can I rename the audio clips I've made in spectral layers after I bring them into tracks? All right, let's see if the project is still open. Okay. Um, all right, so let's say we have this project active. Let's jump back here. So. Uh, anytime, so let's make sure that I'll go to my window setup here and we're gonna have the over, yeah, we'll just, sorry about that, all right. Okay, so you'll see file and description here. So let's say, you know, if you didn't like the particular name for the file, you could just come here, type the name in, and then that will carry over, that will change the name of the file directly from the info line. So make sure that you come to the little info line and that you have name and description checked, and then you could change those settings directly from the info line. Uh, 
so you see, question, uh, hi, Greg, can I record a MIDI track while I tweak some knobs in real time? Certainly. So no problem at all doing that. So if you wanted to, uh, I'll just come over here. Let's add retro log. All right, so say. And I just have these kind of set up as quick controls. So if I wanted to just come right over here. Um, so I'm just using my choice OS controller here. Uh, it's a MIDI fader box for quick controls. And we could assign these to uh, whatever function that we really want it to open up here. So it'll kind of have some default settings. So let's say we want to record the MIDI. So now, if I want to play that back, all I have to do is oh, and if I automate the parameters, that would help. So, sorry about that. So since we have it as quick controls, So everything that I just automated will now play back as expected. So no problem. And if it's just uh, like MIDI messages into the synth, you could capture that into the MIDI event itself and just record it as MIDI data. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, when I begin to create an instrument track and I look at the list of EST instruments, some of them have three bars next to them and some don't. What do those three bars mean? That indicates that those particular plugins are VST3 plugins, so as opposed to VST2, so. All right, uh, so you just see from Robbie Bowling, uh, if I want to use the same reverb on 10 tracks as a send, what is the best way to set that up? All right. Okay, and I'll just revert. Okay, so let's say I have like dry drums here. So I'm going to select the tracks I want to put the reverb on. Right click, I have these selected. So to select these, what I do is I select the top one, hold down the shift key, select the bottom track. All those tracks in between will be selected. Right click, you'll see add track. Sneak over and you'll see add effects channel to selected channels. I say, like, okay, I want to add the revelation. So now these are all being sent to this one reverb. And I could set varying amounts. So let's say I wanted to come and take the snare top. I go to descends and now I could add various levels. And again, if I want to select like all of these channels. So let's say, okay, I'm gonna select this channel and this channel. And what I want to do is enable quick link and I want to turn them off. We'll turn quick link off or then, so now I can say, okay, I want snare. So these are all being sent to the same reverb in varying amounts.
So once again, select the tracks, select, hold down shift, select the bottom, right click, add track, uh, add effects channel to the selected channels, and then that will automatically be routed there for you. All right, so we see from uh, the Studio uh, International, um, I got my third UR824 this week and got them all working together after many hours of thinking of doing a uh, video. Here's there very little out there about linking them together. Um, and this is from Andrew in Lincolnshire, UK. Yeah, so basically, you know, you're going to have one interface and then the other two will work as kind of like ADAT uh almost like ADAC converters. So you're going to take the analog eight analog inputs and outputs, and then in the uh, DSP mix effects console, then route that into, um, you know, you're going to take the eight analog ins and outs, patch those to the ADAC connection, and then patch that into the other. So that way you could have uh, 24 ins and outs. So if you need to track 24 sources at once, it's a great solution in three rack spaces. Um, so I just see from Uno Memento, I did renaming just like you advise. It says could not rename the file. What's next? So, uh, you know, make sure that the file, uh, I assume that the file is dragged out, uh, into the project window. Um, but I, I don't know if maybe, you know, like the, the file system is set to read only, or something like that, but I didn't do anything special to rename it. All right, so we see, um, is it possible for a channel to be a member of more than one link group, i.e. track B, follows track A's pan and track B also follows track C's volume. Um, I think that it's only going to be like, you know, I think the channels can only be in different uh, link groups, but I'll test it. But I think it's going to be once a track is in a particular link. Um, so let's come here. All right, so I want to, at this point, we'll link volume on these two. Yeah, so I think channels can only be in one link group and that could cause all sorts of um, issues that could come up unexpectedly if people don't specify. Uh, but I think it's only going to be um, in one particular link group at a time. So, But you could always copy automation if you need to. All right, so we see from XQBaseX says, hello, Greg, I've been here from the start. Thank you so much for the live stream. Seriously, fantastic. So I'm glad that they're helpful for people and glad that you can make it. And thanks for popping in and saying hi. All right, uh, so it says, uh, 
uh, question regarding the MIDI in place editing. I set it up in preferences, but when I double click, it still opens it in the lower zone. All right, so let's say I have, all right, so let's say if we want to come over here, so let's say I have this set it to my mix console. And we'll go to editors, so let's say, I want this and we'll say double click opens in a window. So there that automatically just did it. I'll try it on a different project where you can see it maybe a little better, has some data on it. So uh, at this point, uh, just went to preferences to editors and we'll say default MIDI editor is the in place editor and double click opens editor in window. So now as soon as I double click here, it just opens it in the in place editor. So make sure that you have the preferences set like that. Um, so if you have it still where this is open in the in place editor uh, and you don't have the other preference set that it will still open in the lower zone. So again, make sure you have this double click opens in a window. And that should do it for you. Great. All right, seeing discussion of granular synthesis and CPU and or real-time audio performance usage. All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, it says, uh, when using Steinberg sound card, how can I see as an insert which effects are built into the sound card to avoid latency when recording? Uh, my example is a UR44. So, um, so it, it could depend on, you know, so one is you want to make sure that when you go to, let's say I go to my audio connections and I'm gonna make sure, I'll just switch my preset to one stereo. And all right, so we have this sub. So I want to add and on the URC interfaces and URRT2, RT4, um, when we go to open up, like an, we add an audio track and I will make this the active. So let's say I add an audio track to, to see the built-in DSP, you want to A, make sure that you're set to be in direct monitoring. So go to your studio, to studio setup, select the uh, UR44 here, um, and hit OK. So now once we do that, um, we say, OK, this is going into stereo in one, and then you'll see hardware settings. So the hardware DSP, um, let me, let me just check my, here, I'll just make this a mono source, so. Make sure I'm in. Okay, I'm sorry, I just switch this, okay. So now once I have 
the input routing, I could come over here to the inspector. Uh, and now I could see my RevX reverb and these are being powered from the actual, and if I wanted to have an insert such as the morphing channel strip, I could, these are coming from the hardware DSP. And earlier, like the first generation UR44, when you go into the mix console, you would go to the input channels and you would see a hardware routing just like this. And then you could enable the hardware settings on the input channel. And these settings, those are coming from the onboard DSP of the UR44. So either way, you could try those. All right, uh, so see, thank you, Greg. Now I don't know how to close these uh, in-part editors. All right, so if you have something that's in like an in-place editor, so let's say I'm here, I'm looking at this, I think it's just shift, um, is it control shift I or alt? You know, you could close it there, but let me see. Um, so just uh, control or command plus shift and the letter I for in place. So control or command plus shift and I, and that could open and close the particular editors, or you could just click right here in that icon, and that's how you could close the in place editor. All right, so we see um, question, is it possible to set the lower zone to always open in another monitor? Uh, has multiple monitors, Cubase 12? So certainly. Um, so once we come to here, so let's say I go to the preferences and this is like a typical way that many film composers will work where they have a dedicated screen just for the key editor. I remember, uh, you know, the wonderful composer, Pinar Toprak, she was just telling me, he's like, I see the key editor more than my children in a day. Uh, so we're gonna say open, double click opens in an in a edit, w editor in a window. So once we do this and I double click, it's gonna open up on a window and all you have to do is move that over to your secondary screen. And then every time you double click on a MIDI editor, it's gonna go to where the MIDI editor position was, and that could be on a separate monitor. So you could definitely do that. So just to set the preference, you come to preferences, to editors, and double click opens editor in a window instead of lower zone. And then once you position that editor window to the second screen, that positioning will be remembered. Okay, uh, so we see from Robbie Bowling, uh, I have a keyboard that shows many of the key commands. Is there a documentation for some of the others? So I think that there are, and I think sometimes Jazz Dude has a, a link uh, that he's always so kind enough to provide. But if you wanted to find the key commands, you know, what's really good is, you know, go to edit and then you could go to the key commands here. So we could see all the key commands. And if you're like, oh, what does this key command do? Just type it in. If you click here, you could type the key in and it'll actually tell you what that particular key command does. But you can see all the key commands listed here, but there are websites and I think spreadsheets available online that have all the default key commands listed. All right, so I think I'm approaching being out of questions again. We'll see if there's any more that kind of sneak in. Thanks again for all the wonderful questions. If you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button. And remember we do these every, um, 
every Tuesday and Friday, just sitting here helping you out. All right, uh, so we have a question from Skinny Breakfast. How can I print in effects to a new track, uh, i.e. reverb effects channel printed as audio to a new track? Okay, so let's say uh, I'll jump over to this project. All right, let's see if we still have our reverb sends here, so let's say. All right, so let's say I have all these going on. And so one way is to just say, okay, I want to take like all the tracks here. Um, you could go to export audio mix down. And then I'll just say, let's select just a reverb. And after export, let's uh, create audio track. So now as we do this, we'll call this verb print. Uh, and I want it to be a WAV file. And now as we listen to it, this will just be the reverb printed. So once again, just go to your export audio mix down and you want to just choose the reverb and create af on after export, create audio track. See the jazz dude pr provided the key commands link. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, uh, what are the advantages of Cubase that it has for considering migration? So I think that Steinberg does a really good job of having the ideas and concepts before other companies and they don't have to react to features uh, that basically they define the feature set for the industry, you know, whether it's editing audio in real time, whether it's having parts on your project window, these concepts, you know, having tools, these concepts have really kind of taken a hold, you know, being able to do all the processing on your computer CPU instead of, you know, soon to be obsolete DSP proprietary solutions. Um, and the fact that we run equally strong on Mac and PC and that, you know, you can do all sorts of really, you know, it doesn't predispose you to a particular workflow. So if you're doing rock tracks, you're doing, I'm a composer doing heavy orchestral stuff. I'm doing, you know, techno EDM, I'm doing hip hop, you know, whatever production Cubase can do very well you know plus it's a stunning mix engine and we have these really cool uh we have this amazing community for the live streams where we sit here and help you out so okay so we have from val lee's there's no question just want to say thank you again so much help every time love you so just glad to uh be able to help people and thanks for the kind words uh, so we see any plans to add more keyboard shorts, shortcuts to Cubase? I noticed they had Pro Tools and stuff. Just wonder if Steinberg planned to add more from other DAWs. So there's actually, I think like a lot of the Studio One presets, what people have told me, you know, copy and mimic the Steinberg presets. Um, so I haven't heard of any plans for that. It's always a great thing to have, but you know, when it comes to development resources, it could come kind of low on a priority list. Um, 
but uh, I haven't heard of any plans, but I'll, I'll mention it and put it in my reports. Um, so you just see hi Greg can I record a MIDI track while tweak some knobs real time so yeah definitely so we showed it just a couple minutes ago all right um, so it just says when I change uh, control rooms gain on one project while I open in our project the gain is not resetting how to reset the control room meters and settings. So I think that the control room is project independent. Um, so those settings kind of persist regardless of whatever project. So when you save a control room, it's, it's designed to be independent of the project. So it's not going to, you know, necessarily switch all the plugins and um, controls from one project and change it when loading a different project. So the mix console will be recalled, but the control room is set to be kind of project agnostic, if you will. Good to see from uh, just comments and thank you for your time to explain your ideas. Thanks for being a part of the live stream. All right. Uh, so we see from Jeremy Spencer, uh, hi Greg, any update on the bug fix where the MIDI blocks are not lined up rendered correctly? So I believe it'll be in the next maintenance release. Um, I can't really comment when that will be uh, released to the market, um, but I know that Steinberg is aware of it and I think it's already been addressed. Uh, but you know, still going through some other quality assurance tests. So, but I can't really indicate when it'll be released, but I know that Steinberg is aware of the issue, so. All right. So I think I'm at the end of the list. And see how we're doing. So thank you for all the wonderful questions from everyone. Let's see, we're at 135 likes. That's great. All right, we'll see if there's more coming. All right, so we see from Patrick just saying, thank you, Greg. So you're welcome, glad to be able to help. And we see about, uh, he's, he's Val Lee's looking forward to that as OCD kicks so hard all the time with the MIDI blocks, I understand. See Michael Pierce, I think, is taking off for the weekend, so it's great to have a wonderful weekend. I'm looking forward to, we have a kind of a, a chilly cook-off Oktoberfest celebration at our local park tomorrow, so looking forward to that. Mark Winslow, thank you, just says, uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. Well, thanks for being a part of the community today. All right, wonderful to see Sable Winters on. See if there's more questions come in. If not, we will go ahead and wrap up just a little early. All right, I'll wait another 20 seconds or so. See if there's more questions to sneak in. See, Chris just say, yes, Greg, I've been watching you since more than 10 years now. I was like, yeah, it was an early one. Yeah, now all these people are doing tutorials. I was kind of doing it early on, so thank you. All right. 
see if there's more questions. I know there's usually a bit like a 20 second delay from when I talk to when you guys hear. in there just a couple seconds and then I'll wrap up and I can go meet my son at the bus stop. All right. Uh, so with that, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. I want everyone to have a safe and healthy weekend and we'll see everyone back on Tuesday. Uh, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Uh, everyone have a great weekend. I look forward to seeing everyone uh, please take care and see you next week. Goodbye.